So the idea that architecture needs to change in order to deal with the current pressures, I think architecture is always in a condition of change. Certainly as architects, we're always in a condition of change because we're constantly challenging norms and challenging uh, accepted conventions and trying to see if if there are not so much new but better ways of being or better ways of practicing architecture. I think what's very interesting about the current discussion is how inventive architecture needs to be and how agile and quickly we as professionals and as teachers can respond to these pressures. Uh, I mean, what's interesting about the, the theme I used this morning for the daylight talk was Geography of Hope. And that was written by somebody called Nicholas Olsberg, whom I've never met, I don't know, but I really enjoyed a series of essays written on uh, four architects uh, practicing in the 50s to the 60s, recovering from the war and thinking, rethinking uh, values and making projects which were on the one hand to do with the, the tragedy of the war and on the other where it was to do with the, the space age and the arrival of a new technology and it's the combination of those things. And it was really fascinating in terms of reading those essays in the context of where we are now because it's, it's a war with, with climate, let's say. It's a war with ourselves, it's a war with um, consumerism it's, uh, and there is war. Uh, there's war all over the world and it's, uh, it's a terrifying place we live in in many ways. But I suppose what's also important is to think about change as being positive, that it wasn't exactly a utopia to start with where we are now. I mean before the urgency of climate change was really put on the agenda. You know, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, people can't access housing, the thing of democracy is being challenged, there are all kinds of things that are happening in the world. But somehow day to day as architects, we're probably, some people would say naive, but we're great believers in human invention. We're great believers in uh, the capacity of architecture to change, to change things. The invention of architects, you know, we teach and there are, we see young people doing research on how to make buildings in different ways, how to think in different ways about, about landscape, about the resources, about water, about solar energy. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of amazing things happening. So, I think it's, I haven't been to this Venice Biennale yet, but I think um, it's very important to put this, this issue on the table to confront our thinking and to challenge our thinking as architects. But I suppose it's also important to have a, a sense of belief and optimism. And in a way, you can't be an architect without being optimistic. You just can't because you're trying to invent every day. You're trying to make a, a room of the future or a house. I don't mean in, in a kind of crazy way. I just mean you're making something which is going to happen tomorrow. It's not there today. So you're thinking about the, the future. And that keeps you... Uh, agile and keeps you thinking. And I, I think the confrontation of, 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 of what the Biennale sounds like will give a platform for, for these issues, make them more um, visible uh, and um, incite discussions. And many of the people in our office who have been to the Biennale felt that um, 
it, it's, it's really, in, they find it very stimulating to rethink how we practice architecture. But that's also an optimistic thing, to engage with the, with the urgency of something, but being equipped with, uh, with a belief and a, a sense of optimism and a sense of, uh, of hope. And it was very interesting yesterday, there was a session with um, Francis Carré and a Danish geologist, Minik, I'm afraid I can't remember his second name. Orsing. Yes. Uh, and that was fascinating because he brought a rock up to the lectern and he talk about, talked about this rock <clears throat> and that all inhabitants of the planet always leave a footprint, whether it's a, a tiny insect, whether it's, a, um, uh, whether it's birds, whether it's ants, whether it's whatever, that there are all these organisms which change the world every day and build structures within which they, which they live. And he talked about this, this thing that, that there's, you know, the, the, the idea that, that we stop building, he, he says it's not in the nature of things to stop building, that, that uh, we, we and all the other inhabitants of this earth, all the, 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 inha the biosphere of the, of the earth, let's say, are continually working and making and changing the earth. And he went on to speak about um, about this and talked about the things that can change. But then he said that um, architects must make beautiful things. He, he, he was provoking, I think, the theme of the, of the conference. And he was saying, you know, there, there's so much research happening and so many inventions and so many new things being, being examined and tested and uh, to leave that to the engineers, but that I don't really actually agree with him on that. But um, he, he was also saying that architects should not forget beauty, that, that our role, and he said, yes, be economical with resources, but sometimes using a little bit more of resources makes something beautiful, and is that worth it or not? So it was very um, refreshing to find a geologist who's, who was talking in billions of years in terms of the things he was describing. And he was talking about the White Cliffs of Dover being a kind of a, a naturally made organ, organic uh, form and that all these, I was going to say people, all these um, uh, animals or termites or whatever they are, he said they, you know, they have an infrastructure of life embedded in the cliffs and that he sees life everywhere. And it was very interesting. I suppose that's what's great about being an architect is that you need other disciplines to help you. I mean, you can't build a building as an architect. You need builders and engineers and fantastic people who bring a whole other layer of richness. And I think geographers and geologists and social um, economists and all of those people are really important to be able to engage with. So architecture is such an open subject. It can learn from anything. Uh, I, I really, I feel very strongly about that, about, uh, what, about the idea of community as a resource. And when we talk about resources, especially in the architectural world, we're talking about concrete or sand or timber or landscape or whatever. But the thing of human resources, that's, that's, that's infinite in its possibilities. And also it's, it's something that hasn't been valued. Um, everything nowadays mitigates against forming a healthy community where people overlap. It's like the whole world is about separating people. There's an obsession with privacy. Privacy is considered to be luxury. You have high-end housing separate from uh, social housing. They don't want to mix. They don't want to use the same 
public spaces, you know, whereas um, historically the most vibrant communities, and that's what cities are about, where, where um, a really poor person shares the same space as a really rich person and they can learn and benefit from each other. And also the thing of collaboration in communities, we can see um, what Francis Carré has done and uh, and it's 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 energy. It's it's an energy that that somehow and to empower people and gives them a sense of dignity and ownership and uh, not feel like they're being really pushed down by the whole weight of of commerce usually or politics uh, or whatever. So it's it's um, it's it's a really important point. Uh, what's fascinating about architecture is that there's nothing that isn't relevant. Um, I would say that at the core of architecture is a radical sense of uh, supporting equality and democracy, uh, that architecture treats the human being or enables the human being to enjoy space, whether they own it or not. I, I was really struck when we were curating the Venice Biennale and um, Rosanna Montiel from Mexico uh, gave a presentation and she was talking about working with a community uh, making a sewage treatment plant, I think it was. And she was having all these meetings about the infrastructure that would be needed and what they would need to do. And then she said, and it needs to be beautiful. And somebody in the community said, but do we deserve beauty? And I just thought that just, that just touched a chord that you realize that um, society sometimes takes away people's dignity and their sense of their right to beauty. So that incites in one uh, a kind of um, a radical component which we have to keep quiet about because we deal with money and commerce and clients and all kinds of people. So it's like there's a, there's a kind of an undercurrent in the world of architecture where you're, you're trying to navigate um, things which can't always be expressed or are not always asked for or not always needed and that you still feel you have a role to make a place for the stranger, for the unspoken wishes. We use the term for uh, the passerby who can enjoy a gate or a door or a wall even if they can't enter. And the history of architecture does that, even the most severe societies and you could say Florence was a very tough society. It was the rich and the poor, but they made a stone seat at the facade of the Medici Palace where people could sit. So there was an outdoor room for people and then there was indoor rooms. And there was civic space. And it, civic space is interesting because it's a civilizing force. And there's also the thing of isolation, that when you, you are made to feel part of a bigger order, then you, you, you feel connected. If, if you're isolated as an individual, it's, very, it's a very black place to be. So there's a lot of things about architecture that one needs to, I suppose, one automatically, because it's about hu humanism in the end. And working with students with educational buildings and teaching we always think that students are so brave, the way architecture students, especially because every week they have to expose their worst drawings, their worst schemes, or their best drawings, the best schemes, and they're continually critiqued. And they're just brave. They just try something, and then they try again. And, and sometimes they're dropped into worlds that they're alone in, and they can't find their place because they're not formed as a as a person and they're searching so we feel the making environments for students needs to be caring have that sense of somehow caring for the individual and at the same time 
making places where people are comfortable being together. Yeah, in relation to humanity of the everyday, we've learned a lot from Milan, spending six years in Milan, making uh, the Bocconi University building there. And I remember one day visiting a 1960s apartment building by uh, architect Angelo Mangiarotti. And before we worked in Milan, I have to, I'm embarrassed to admit that we didn't know the work of this architect, but we found it's a, it's a beautiful little tower. Uh, it's about 10 or 12 stories, an apartment building. And what we found was that you didn't enter the tower directly. You, you, you entered a little bit away from the tower and you came through a beautiful gate and you walked down steps and there was lavender planted along the steps. And then you got to a door. And there was a little seat where you could leave your bag or have a conversation with your neighbor or look for your keys. And then you came into the entrance hall and then you crossed a bridge and the car was going to the car park underneath you. And then you came into this home. It just felt like home. And I hadn't seen a building like that in a very long time, that you felt that the agenda of the architect was different to what it is now. That sometimes you feel a building is very impressive, but it doesn't take you by the hand. It doesn't take you by the hand in the same way and lead you to someplace. It, it's, and we, we just felt very, it, I think it changed our way of thinking about about going home, simply, um, how to make a home, uh, what is it about, about, about that sense of what architecture can do as a, as a welcoming uh, element, let's say. So what's fascinating about being an architect is that um, something a geologist or a neurologist or a psychiatrist or a musician can say you can use. There's nothing you can't use as a, as a source of knowledge and inspiration.